like to welcome everybody to our special joint seminar. This is a joint seminar of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics, uh, the Indiana University Department of Intelligence Systems Engineering, the Biocomplexity Institute, and the Institute for Advanced Study. We're very pleased tonight to have Professor Claire Bryant from the University of Cambridge who is visiting. And we very much like to thank uh, the Institute for Advanced Study Collaborative Research Award Program for enabling the visits of both Dr. Bryant and Dr. Gary Ann from the University of Vermont uh, to work on collaborative projects involving bacterial infection and immune response between species. Tonight, uh, Dr. Bryant is going to be talking to us about uh, immune response uh, in a variety of contexts. And I need to tell you that the meeting is live streamed and recorded, so please be aware of that. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'd like to introduce the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. This is an international group uh, dedicated to developing uh, computational and quantitative approaches to understanding immune response in a variety of contexts. If you're interested in learning more, you can follow the group at Twitter, MSM Viral. Uh, you can register at the website IMAG wiki and amnibib.nih.gov working groups multiscale modeling and viral pandemics. And you can find an archive of more than 120 previous seminars on YouTube. And I will share those links uh, in a few minutes with people. Uh, for the IMAG MSM, uh, community. I'd like to introduce myself, James Blazier, uh, co-lead of the working group, along with Tom Helicar of University of Nebraska, Jim Sluka, and Lorenzo Vescini of King's College London. And for those of you who are IMAG MSM members, I'll remind you that we have our digital twin subgroup meeting tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. EDT. Now I'd like to introduce Claire Bryant, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and PhD, Fellow of the British Pharmacological Society, very distinguished visitor from Cambridge, UK. Uh, she's a professor of innate immunity in the departments of medicine and veterinary medicine in Cambridge. She is one of the world experts in the date immune signaling response to pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors during bacterial infections in chronic diseases of humans and animals. And we're gonna hear a lot about that today. Uh, she's known for her collaborations across disciplines with mathematicians, physicists, and others to try to understand both the fundamental biology of host pathogen interactions and their therapeutic modification. Uh, she's developed a number of important methodologies and applied those in the context of immune response. Uh, she has extensive translational experience with sabbaticals at Genentech and GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, she's on the scientific advisory boards of numerous biotech companies, and she has been involved in a number of important startups. She also uh, founded and runs a important international seminar series on called Inflamazoom, and we encourage you to take a look at that. I don't want to take any more time from her, and I'm going to turn over the meeting for her. Thank you, James. Um, so I'd like to thank James and colleagues for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be in Bloomington and I'd like to thank the IAS for the funding. I've never been to Indiana before, so it's a new adventure. It's also the first time I've been back to America since COVID um, and so I've missed coming to the States, so it's a real pleasure to be back. So what my research group does is really try and understand how the body sees a pathogen, how it responds to it, and how that regulates the infection and drives the immune response. And the broad uh, area that we've been thinking about um, are zoonotic pathogens. That's a pathogen that jumps from animals where it can reside uh, without causing any disease. But once it reaches the human host, it uh, causes um, a disease of various severity. And of course, this is all familiar to us because that's exactly what COVID is, but I'm not going to talk about COVID. Um, and so we've been really funded uh, to understand how the first wave of detecting infection then potentially triggers an adaptive immune response in the context of trying to produce vaccines and improve vaccines. And so this centers around pattern recognition receptor signaling. So patterns, pat 
pathogens, express molecules, uh, which are unique to the pathogen, and they're called pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. And pattern recognition receptors recognize the PAMPs as non-host molecules. Um, but there are now, we recognize there are some danger associated molecular patterns, which are um, molecules produced by the host that also trigger the pattern recognition receptors. And the function then of the pattern recognition receptors are to activate innate immune signaling to control the infection. And innate immune signaling really uh, drives an inflammatory response. And the whole point of inflammation is to try and control an infection. So a successful innate immune response will clear the pathogen infection but if the response is dysregulated, this can then lead to the production of severe inflammatory disease. And we now think that, that this is the mechanism that underpins a number of um, really common uh, diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and so forth. So it's, it's a really important mechanism, understanding the dysregulation of inflammation driven by innate immunity. So that's, that's the fundamental interest of my lab. So. For the purposes of the talk today, I am going to uh, discuss a lot of work on salmonella. And I don't think that this is going to, this won't show on Zoom, will it? The pointer, I'm gonna to need to use, use the mouse. Yeah, I'm gonna try and use the mouse. Yeah, I can't see my mouse on the screen at the moment, James, hold on. I think I might just soldier on. Um, so what you can see on uh, this slide is what happens when salmonella infects a host. So the uh, bacterium, which is the structure in the top left micrograph, uh, salmonella is a gram-negative rod bacterium, which has, uh, you can see here, little strands coming away from it. These are the flagella. These flagella are important because salmonella is highly motile and the flagella is the motor apparatus that drives salmonella around. But the flagella are also the proteins that make it up are immunogenic, so they become an important part of the story of, of how the body sees salmonella. Once salmonella comes into contact with the epithelial cells of the gut lining, it actually triggers, uh, by injecting proteins into the epithelial cell, it triggers a response whereby the epithelial cell can engulf the bacterium. What can, can then happen, depending upon what salmonella infection you have, if you have a, a salmonella infection that just causes a gut upset, it will inflame the epithelial cell and cause uh, diarrhea to occur. But some species of salmonella, uh, for example, typhoid, uh, actually become a systemic infection, which means they cross through the epithelial cell and enter into the body. And once in the body, they reside in macrophages where they can hide from the immune system, but that then undergoes an arms race whereby the salmonella sits in the macrophage. It will try and kill the cell. It will try and grow within the cell. The cell will try and kill the bug. Um, so there's, there's this arms race between the, the macrophage and the bacterium. And uh, whether you live or die from salmonella really depends upon how efficiently the, cell, the macrophages are able to control salmonella growth and destroy it. So the macrophage is a phagocyte, it's a key cell of the innate immune system. And the whole function of the macrophage really is to seek and destroy pathogens. So pattern recognition receptors in the context of salmonella, there are multiple pattern recognition receptors which um, recognize salmonella. So salmonella has uh, a molecule in its cell wall, which is called lipopolysaccharide. That's an incredibly toxic molecule. It's recognized by a receptor called tolerite receptor four. Uh, this sits in the membrane of the cell. It triggers the, uh, once it's activated, it triggers a signal transduction pathway to produce the transcription of a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines. In the epithelial cell, Salmonella is recognized at the membrane level by tolerite receptor 5. This recognizes the flagellin, and again, this triggers the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. But salmonella, then once it goes into the cell, is contained in something called a salmonella-containing vacuole. And from this vacuole, salmonella can fire various molecules into the cytosol of the cell. Uh, this includes flagellin, also uh, proteins from a, a special type three secretory system, which is a, a series of bacterial proteins that form an injection needle um, and then injects proteins into the cell. Uh, 
Both these proteins and flagellum can be sensed by a cytosolic receptor, which is called the NAEP nodlite receptor for the C4 complex, NAEP NLRC4. This complex recruits an adapter protein, which then activates an effector protein, which is called caspase 1. And caspase 1 is uh, clusters, needs to cluster to be active. And what this protein complex then does is it degrades pro IL1 beta and pro IL18 which are two pro-inflammatory cytokines to their active forms. It also cleaves a protein called gastomin D, and the end terminal of gastomin D then goes and forms pores in the cell membrane, and this then facilitates the release of the cytokines uh, out of the cell. Ultimately, though, these pores lead to uh, lysis of the cell through a protein called Ninja-1, and that causes an explosive form of cell death. Uh, salmonella also releases other molecules, and we're not exactly sure what they are, that activates a second cytosolic receptor called NLRP3. Um, this also activates caspase 1. It also um, drives cleavage of the pro-inflammatory cytokines IL-1, beta, and IL-18. But it doesn't really lead to cell death through gastomin D. I'm, I'm not sure we really understand exactly why that is, but it's, it's less efficient at killing cells than the NLRC4 inflammasome. And then finally, uh, LPS can go into the cytosol. Uh, this can then trigger a protein called caspase 11. Uh, and the function of caspase 11 when it oligomerizes is to cleave gastomin D and drive the uh, inflammatory cell death or pyroptosis pathway. So there's a multitude of pathways that can be activated by salmonella. And we've spent the last 15 to 20 years really trying to understand how these pattern recognition receptors trigger immune responses to salmonella and how important they are in the process of controlling disease. So to show you how this works uh, in real time, really, sort of real time anyway. Um, so what you've got here is um, uh, live imaging or real time imaging, which, which we sped up, but it's, it's basically live cell imaging. And the green cells are the macrophages. And we have transduced these macrophages. So in other words, the macrophages are expressing the pro-inflammatory transcription factor NF-kappa B, which is linked to green fluorescent protein. And what you can see here, this is a macrophage. This is a cytosol, and you can see it's all green because that's where the majority of the NF-kappa B resides. And what we're going to do then is we're going to add salmonella. And the salmonella are also green. And you can need to watch what happens to the NF-kappa B in all these cells. And hopefully what you can see, you can see the green bugs, and you can also see that the, um, nucle the NF-kappa B has moved from the cytosol into the nucleus, and it's moving back out again. Now, a key point to note here is that all the cells have activated NF-kappa B, whether they're infected or not. And that, that's a really important uh, part of this process. And it is kind of mysterious. So these cells are macrophages and their job is to take things up. Yet throughout this process, some of the cells just never get infected at all. So this cell never gets infected. But you can see this cell here has lots of bacteria within it. So the first part you're seeing here, the activation of NF-kappa B is actually the triggering of toll-like receptor 4, which activates NF-kappa B, moves into the nucleus. And then the NF-kappa B binds onto the promoter of pro-inflammatory genes and drives its transcription. So that's what's happening in the first movie. In the second movie, you need to focus on this cell, which is, as you can see, absolutely loaded with bacteria now. Note, this cell is uninfected still. If you watch this cell, you can see it exploded. And so that's the pyroptotic event, pyroptosis or the explosive cell death, which is actually doing two things it's kind of interesting because the, some of the bacteria have escaped but some of them are trapped in the debris of the cell and that's a macrophage net trapping the bacteria into position so that is the process that's triggered by the cytosolic nod light receptor c4 so that was inflammasome activation and the first movie was toll light receptor activation and so we made these movies a long time ago 2012 you can see the date on the movie and, and I still can't explain to you why there's a heterogeneity in the cellular infection. Um, there's a whole host of really interesting factors. I don't know why some of the uh, cells have not got infected. 
you can actually see sometimes that some of these macrophages go and talk to the infected macrophages and then they walk away. There's a whole, whole host of physiology that I don't understand in these movies. So pattern recognition receptors signal in an unusual way. So people who are more familiar with traditional signal transduction pathways will know what happens is the receptor gets activated. There's a series of phosphorylation steps and eventually you end up with something happening in the nucleus. That would be situation normal. Pattern recognition receptors don't signal like that. What they do is they form um, macromolecular signaling complexes in the cell. So instead of acting by a series of phosphorylation steps, they act by a series of recruitment steps to bring proteins together. And in bringing proteins together, they form a conformational change. And that then brings another set of proteins into play, which then in induces another conformational change. And so this is really characteristic of pattern recognition receptor signaling. So in the context of toll light receptors, uh, the midosome is a key signaling complex that's formed just downstream of the toll light receptors. And this has been structurally characterized by how we, this is beautiful structure here. Uh, in the context of NLRC4, the inflammasome is formed. And this is a, one of our super resolution pictures of the inflammasome. And what you can see here is this is the adapter protein ASC, and this is the effector protein caspase 1 in the middle. So the, these complexes in the inflammasome is actually enormous. It's much bigger than the imidazone. So these complexes are really interesting and it, it's a very, it's an unusual way of signaling, but it, it is really, really symptomatic of how pattern recognition receptors signal. And so the questions that we've been asking uh, all along the way is we know pattern recognition receptors are present. We've wanted to understand what they do in macrophages or dendritic cells. So how, do they control bacteria there? What are the cytokines that are produced? What's the cellular physiology that's going on in these cells? But also then to understand how uh, the dendritic cells and the um, antigen presenting cells interact with T cells to then control an adaptive immune response. And this is important um, in order to uh, generate better vaccines. We need to understand how pattern recognition receptor cells and antigen presenting cells drive differentiation of T cells to generate good memory responses. Um, so this has occupied a massive amount of our time over the last few years. So when we started out, we were most interested in the toll light receptor signaling. And to be honest, there was quite a lot of background literature which suggested that toll light receptor 4 was going to be the answer to life, universe and everything. So we set out with a, a really simple set of questions to understand how TLR4 signaled and how that worked in the context of infection. So just to backtrack a little, this is uh, an E. coli, but salmonella looks very similar. Um, the key effect on key thing that drives and activates toll light receptor 4 is endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. It's a constituent of the bacterial cell wall and its structure is a lipid. And the lipid structure is super important to how efficient it activates TLR4. So salmonella like E. coli has a structure with <clears throat> a backbone with two phosphorylation groups. Two phosphorylation groups are very, very important for toll light receptor 4 signaling. It also has six acyl chains. And the number of acyl chains, the length of the acyl chains and the phosphorylation groups dictate how efficient TLR4 is activated. So first of all, what happens in vivo? So we use um, a model of salmonella whereby we take mice, we inject them intravenously with salmonella and it's an attenuated strain of salmonella. And then we count the bacterial load over time. And this has been really well worked out, particularly by Carlos and Machin and Dunder Maskell. Um, and we understand how the bacteria grow over time. And we're starting to understand how the immune response impacts on the bacterial growth curve. So we can learn a lot. If you understand the immune response that's going on, you can then understand how pattern recognition receptors impact on that immune response by taking them away and comparing the response of knockout mouse with wild type mice. So all this work's been done by Panitura Melosis in the lab. And what he does is he injects the mice. And on day one, the bacteria are controlled by reactive oxygen species by complement um, in a really clear way. And this causes a drop of bacteria on day one. However, after day one, the bacteria grow at one log a day until they are controlled at 
between day five to seven. And this control is driven by inflammation. So this is a really important part of the response. At this point, the bacteria are in a static phase where the, the growth and death responses are equal. And this is driven by macrophages, TNF-alpha, various classical inflammatory responses. And this status quo exists until about day 15 to 20. And at this point, the adaptive immune response kicks in. And in the context of salmonella infection, bacteria are then cleared by a Th1 uh, response from CD4 positive T cells. So we are super interested in understanding what controls the bacterial growth and then how the bacteria are cleared and what, what role pattern recognition receptors play in this response. So for TLR4, we knew from earlier work and from our own work that actually if you put in a normal salmonella, TLR4 drives the inflammatory response. So a normal wild type salmonella, TLR4 mouse, knockout mouse cannot control the infection at all. So, and this, we, we knew this from work that was done many years ago, actually. So we, we validated it in our mouse, but we were then th thought, well, what happens to the adaptive immune response? Does TLR4 play a role in that? And so to do those experiments, you have to use a super attenuated salmonella because they can't control wild type salmonella. And so what you can see here is the bacterial growth curve in the wild type mice with the attenuated strain. And you can see that by day 15, 14 to 15, the mice are starting to clear the bacterium as you'd expect for wild type mice. But what was unexpected to us was that actually the TLR4 knockout mouse also started to clear the bacteria. And we were really surprised about this. I really thought that TLR4 would have a much more profound effect on um, preventing the formation of a CD4 positive T cell response. But clearly these mice are able to generate CD4 positive T cells and they can clear the salmonella infection. And actually, if you take these mice, you let them clear the bacteria. So you're doing a kind of vaccination experiment and then you inject them with fully virulent salmonella later on. They're fully protected against rechallenge. So they're able to generate effector responses, effector T cell responses to clear the bacteria and they can generate memory responses to protect them against the bacteria. And that really was unexpected for us. We didn't expect it to be like that at all. At the same time, we were working on trying to understand how TLR4 signals. And this has been a super interesting project for us because it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, and if you really want to understand how TLR4 signals, you need to understand the structure. You need to understand what happens to the individual signaling proteins in living cells. You need to understand how the TLR4 signal transduces to an NF-kappa B signal. And you need to be able to relate each of the three steps to try and understand exactly how the receptors will signal. And we're doing this in the context of, initially we did it in the context of LPS, but we also wanted to look at other things that didn't activate TLR4 as efficiently. And the reason for that is that although LPS is a super efficient activator of TLR4, there are a number of other molecules which tweak or slightly activate TLR4 signaling, which are very important, by which I mean damps, but they don't activate it fully. So the, there are mechanisms then by which TLR4 signals a bit, but not completely. And it was not obvious how this would work because when we started this work, everybody said, well, TLR4 activation by LPS, it's on or off, and there's not a graduated signal in between. And for LPS, this is actually not that far from the truth. You see a very sharp dose, dose response curve. So this is what you're looking at here. What we've got is we've got macrophages, we've stimulated them with a synthetic LPS, <clears throat> and we're measuring TNF-alpha, which is one of the cardinal cytokines produced by TLR4 activity. And you can see that there's a very sharp dose response curve here, reaches maximum very quickly. So that kind of fitted with what everybody assumed. But we had access to a number of synthetic LPSs that were not very active. And so when you put on this one, this is called CRX555, it doesn't really matter what it is, but it hardly activates TLR4 at all. You can see here it produces a very low level of uh, TNF-alpha. So if you want to understand how you get graded TLR4 signaling, 
these two extremes are really good to study because you can compare how TLR4 behaves and all the signaling responses at the two extremes of the um, activation of TLR4. So the first thing we did was move from bulk populations. So this is, you take a plate, you have a well full of cells and you measure the output of that population of cells. And so we moved into single cells because we wanted to look at single proteins. So therefore we wanted to understand how individual cells signaled. And so what you've got here is, um, if you remember, I showed you the movies and you could see NF-kappa bean moving from the cytosol into the nucleus in the same cells. We have a reporter for TNF-alpha. So you can see uh, the TNF-alpha reporter being switched on and you can correlate that with the NF-kappa bean moving into the nucleus. And that allows you to get a kinetic measure of TLR4 signaling. And so you get single cell outputs, which look like this, low dose of LPS. All the cells respond, but they move, the NF-kappa bean moves into the nucleus more slowly than when you put a high dose of LPS on. Okay, so the key parameter that dictates how efficient TLR4 signals is the speed with which NF-kappa B goes into the nucleus. The CRX molecule, very inefficient stimulator of TNAF, triggers activation and movement of NF-kappa B into the nucleus very slowly. And this is the single cell TNF readout here. But the key thing that we found was that the kinetics, the speed of NF-kappa B translocation into the nucleus was really important. So then we had a whole series of questions about how TLR4 was signaling. So the structural biology showed that TLR4, when it's bound to LPS, forms a dimer. And so the accepted wisdom at the time was that you have monomeric TLR4, you put on LPS, that causes the formation of a dimer, and that then signals. So how then do you move from maximum TLR4 signaling to low levels of TLR4 signaling? Is it at the level of TLR4, do the dimers cluster and does that make more efficient signaling? So the first question we set out to ask was, what happens to TLR4 in live cells in response to triggering by LPS? So did this work with Dave Klenman and his PhD student Sarah Latty and Lee Hopkins was a postdoc in the lab doing this work. So what we did was we took macrophages without any TLR4. Into these macrophages, we put TLR4 with a fluorescent tag on it. So that meant that every single TLR4 in the cell has a fluorescent tag. We then stimulated the cells with LPS, fixed them at different time points. And then what we can do using TURF, which is total internal reflectance microscopy, where you look at the cell surface, was we did a photo bleaching step. And so if you've got a monomeric TLR4 and you shine light at it, eventually it will fade. Okay, and it will decay, a monomer will decay by one photobleaching step. If you've got a dimer, because there's two fluorescent molecules, it will decay by two photobleaching steps. If you've got three, it will decay by three photobleaching steps and so forth. So this allows you to count the number of TLR4 molecules in the membrane that are signaling in response to LPS. And it looks like this. And see the lights going out in the macrophage as it photobleaches. So to cut a monstrously long story short, you never get anything other than monomer and dimer. It's a long and short of it. And in fact, what we found, interestingly, was that TLR4 exists as preformed dimers, which was totally unexpected. So there's monomers and dimers, and we think they're in a dynamic equilibrium. So there's nobody in the literature predicted that would happen. And structural biology, of course, don't forget, is the most favorable confirmation you can find. So with un without ligand present, TLR4 can exist as a monomer or a dimer. And this is what you're seeing here. So 20% of the cells exist as preformed dimers. When you put on LPS, what you do is you transiently increase the number of dimers. So LPS is stabilizing the dimeric form of the receptor, presumably then causing a downstream conformation or change, and that's stimulating signaling. But at no point did we see a trimer or anything other than a monomer or a dimer. And we were able actually to to derive a new model of how TLR4 signals, which is you have monomer and dimer in a dynamic equilibrium. LPS stabilizes the dimer, induces a conformational change, brings the signaling domains together, and that drives signaling. So if it's not TLR4 that's dictating the efficiency of signaling, it must be a downstream molecule. So we started to look at the midosome. 
So this is metasome. It has a number of molecules. I think I can never remember, but I think it's five or six. Six MYD88, which is the first adapter protein that's recruited to the TLR4 receptor complex. This then recruits a series of kinases, and that's responsible for the downstream signaling. So we said, OK, if TLR4 is only signaling from a dimer, what's then happening with the MYD88? Are you getting clusters of MYD88 coming together so that you've got several midosomes joining together? What's exactly happening to midosome formation? So this time, we took cells without any MYD88. We put in fluorescently tagged MYD88 into the cells. And then we stimulated them with LPS and measured midosome formation. Now, when we started to do this, you can see it here. It's quick. Ooh, go back. Those blobs are the midosomes, which you can see in stills here. Now, this was the first time anybody had shown midosome formation in the cell, which was kind of fun. Um, so we looked at the kinetics of the midosomes, and we also noticed something else while we were doing this. So just to convince you that what you were seeing were midosomes, this is an unstimulated cell. And you can see just dispersed MYD88. But one of the things we could see was that midosomes can actually disassemble as well as assemble. So that's presumably the signaling being switched off. So we kind of notice various things along the way. But of course, everything we do is quantified. So we then set about quantifying what happens to midosomes if you stimulate them with a high dose of LPS, a low dose of LPS, or low activity ligand. So if you stimulate cells with a high dose of LPS, you get a lot of midosomes formed. And note the kinetics, they form very quickly. If you use a low dose of LPS, you get fewer midosomes formed and they form more slowly. And if you remember the kinetics of NF-kappa B translocation into the nucleus are really important. So the speed and number of midosome formation, the kinetics here map on really nicely to what's happening downstream. And if you look at the CRX uh, ligand, you can see that there are some midosomes formed, but they form really slowly. So speed, critical, speed of midosome formation is what's dictating the efficiency of signaling. We also saw some interesting effects on the size of the midosomes. So we looked, uh, we used fluorescence intensity to try and measure the size of the midosomes within the cell. They all had a stoichiometry of five to six units for LPS or CRX555. But what we saw with the uh, LPS and not with the CRX555 is the formation of super midosomes. So actually, LPS is driving the formation of midosomes coming together. They were all two midosomes clustering together. And we only saw this if we had efficient TLR4 signaling going on. So with respect to TLR4 signaling, the speed of NF-kappa B translocation to the nucleus is critical. The number of uh, midosomes that are formed and the speed with which the midosomes are formed and the formation of super midosomes are factors that regulate how TLR4 signals efficiently. So that was all fine and very interesting and kept us entertained for quite some while, but it didn't really answer our question about what was happening in response to salmonella and the driving of adaptive immunity. So while we were getting this sort of somewhat disappointing in vivo data, the uh, inflammasomes, the cytosolic pattern recognition receptors were sort of starting to really emerge and we got really excited. We thought, great, TLR4 hasn't done it but we're sure the inflammasomes will tell us the answer to the adaptive immune question that we had. So we started to work on these inflammasomes. So just to remind you, NAPE and NLRC4 recognize flagellin and salmonella proteins, triggers caspase one activation to process pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18, but also to trigger gastroin D cleavage and pyroptotic cell death, inflammatory cell death. NLRP3, we don't know exactly what activates it, it also forms an inflammasome, but it only processes the cytokines. It doesn't trigger the cell death. And those two, it's really important to remember that NLRC4 drives cell death, but NLRP3 doesn't because it becomes important later on. So while we were doing this, this was early on in inflammasome history. One key cardinal feature was noted by everybody who worked with inflammasomes in macrophages. And what they saw was that when you stimulated the cells with an inflammasome ligand, 
you can see the formation of this ASC spec. So ASC is the adapter protein. You can see this big spec complex forming in the cell. But the key feature was that you always only saw one spec. Okay, so we're going, well, this is odd because salmonella triggers two NLRs. So how can that be? Does that mean that in some cells you only trigger NLRP3 and in some cells you only trigger NLRC4? Or do both NLRs come into the same spec complex? So that was a question we set about asking. And in fact, the answer is that both NLRC4 and NLRP3 can exist in the same inflammasome complex. And so this, this upset quite a lot of the uh, inflammasome people, but they've, they've got used to it now. Um, and they, they kind of argued with this for a while, but, but when you use imaging, it's really quite hard to argue that something's not happening. And indeed, we could see that NLRC4 and NLRP3 were in the same inflammasome spec. And, and this again is super resolution microscopy. And at the time, we didn't know that nobody in the world had done two color super resolution microscopy because ignorance is bliss. So you just try it. And oh, look, it worked. <clears throat> and it's really, really clear NLRC4 and NLRP3 in the same inflammasome spec. So this led us to hypothesize that what happens in response to inflammasome activation is that you can recruit whatever receptor you want into this inflammasome signaling complex in order to tailor the immune response towards the pathogen in question, which kind of makes sense. Um, and it, it's more interesting than that, in fact, because not only can you recruit different receptors into the same inflammasome complex, you can also recruit different effectors. So here is ASC and caspase-1, which we've told you about. This is human macrophages, by the way. But actually, when we looked for it, we could also find ASC and caspase-8. So you can have caspase-1, and caspase 8 in the same inflammasome. So the inflammasome complex then can recruit whatever receptor it needs and whatever effector it needs to drive the most appropriate inflammasome response for the pathogen. And this, is a, this has been proven now for several different pathogens. So it's, it's quite a sophisticated system. What happens in vivo then? So, so Pani, bless him, set out to do the experiments. Um, you'll remember the growth curve and you'll remember that we're interested really in whether or not the knockout mouse can clear the salmonella infection because that means that it's driving a CD4 positive T cell response. And disappointingly, every single knockout we tried, they could all clear the response very nicely. Poor Panny, he was crying at this point. And actually he spent a long time breeding multiple knockouts and it really didn't matter. We could take out TLR4, we could take out NLRC4, we could take out everything. And you could get higher bacterial counts. So this, this growth curve here is from the caspase 1, caspase 11 double knockout. This is the wild type mouse, the white circles. This is the double knockout. So it's taking out all the inflammasomes. And you can see that you've got higher bacterial counts there, but there's still a really nice clearance of the uh, bacteria. We, we tried things like kinetic analysis. Would we get different slopes? Could we find anything? Nothing that was different at all. The most interesting of all these mice that came through was actually the NLRC4 knockout. Now you can see it clears quite nicely, but Panino did spend quite a lot of time as well as doing the growth curves, looking at the responses of the T cells as well to try and understand, because we thought they must be doing something to the T cells. So. What he did was he took the spleens from mice that cleared the salmonella to say, OK, let's see if the memory cells, what are the memory cells doing? So he isolated the CD4 positive T cells. He incubated them with salmonella antigen and antigen presenting cells and then measured the memory responses. Now, our hypothesis when we started these experiments was if you took out a pattern recognition receptor, OK, that you'd have a less efficient adaptive immune response because we assumed that the role of pattern recognition receptors was to make sure the most efficient adaptive immune response was formed. And that's true for TLR4. It impacts on the generation of memory immunity quite a bit. It wasn't true for NLRC4. We saw completely the reverse. So in fact, wild type mice here, nice generation of interferon gamma. That's a key measure of the CD4 positive T cell response. But the NLRC4 knockout responses, they had a higher response. They have generating more efficient memory immunity, which didn't make any sense to us at all. And the reason for this is that actually 
there are more memory cells produced. Okay, so this is wild type memory cells, this is NLRC4 knockout cells. And we spent a long time trying to understand the biology behind this because we thought this is most peculiar. Why, why is this happening? And the reason they're happening is the if you go back to the micrograph, you'll remember I told you that NLRC4 and NLRP3 are both activated by salmonella, are both in the same inflammasome complex. So what actually happens when you take out NLRC4 is something very interesting. So NLRC4 causes the death of antigen presenting cells. Okay, so they're taken out. If you take NLRC4 out, your antigen presenting cells live for longer and your NLRP3 is being stimulated. So you're still producing interleukin-18. Interleukin-18 is absolutely essential for driving effective memory immunity. So in the NLRC4 knockout, you've got antigen presenting cells living longer. You've got lots of IL-18. So they generate a lot more memory cells. And so you can see there's more IL-18 in the NLRC4 knockout. There's more interferon gamma in the NLRC4 knockout. And we think it's all based around the, long, the length of life that the antigen presenting cells live and the fact that you can still get interleukin-18 because NLRP3 is still active. It's quite hard to prove that cells live longer in vivo, but that's certainly what the in vitro data would tell us and it would explain what we're seeing in vivo. This has vaccine potential because we thought, well, okay, if we're getting better immune responses, why don't we generate a salmonella that doesn't activate NLRC4? Because that will probably be a more efficient live vaccine. And this is actually not a trivial thing to do because, in fact, what you need to do is to, to change the flagellin gene. Now, the flagellin is the motor of the salmonella, so you need it to swim. And in fact, if you try and change the flagellin gene in the area that's recognizing NLRC4, that NLRC4 recognizes in the flagellin, that can paralyze the bacterium. And if you do that, you completely change how it behaves in vivo. So what we did was we knew that there was a particular commensal E. coli that had a flagellin gene that wasn't recognized by NLRC4. So we dropped that cassette into the salmonella. Salmonella can still swim, but it can't activate NLRC4. And then we did our key experiment. So then we should be able to vaccinate our mice. And this time, we're particularly interested in the wild type mice, because if we vaccinate those mice with an NLRC4 defective salmonella, we should get improved protection when we re-challenge with fully virulent salmonella. And that's what happens. Miracle of miracles. We were absolutely amazed, but it really did work. So this is the um, wild type salmonella vaccine, fully virulent challenge. This is with our mutated salmonella strain that no longer activates NLRC4. And you can see that the gray line, they're much better protected against re-challenge. So this was kind of cool, but nobody's interested in live vaccines, so we never got around to commercializing it. But it, it, was, it was kind of interesting. Um, and I think this has much potential because flagellin is actually used as a, an adjuvant. And there's, there's a really neat potential here that you could make a more efficient flagellin to improve your vaccine responses. But um, if you were all here to have a beer with me, I'd explain to you the attitude of drug companies towards making better adjuvants, which is they're not terribly interested. So this is all fun, but also depressing because there surely must be something which tells the body that salmonella is here. It's got to make a specific adaptive immune response against it. Okay, it's, it's got to make really specific T cells which will protect it against salmonella. But none of the pattern recognition receptors are actually having any real effect. They're not essential. You can take low, all of them out, basically, and they're not essential for driving salmonella specific T cell development. So this caused us a lot of grief. And I was on sabbatical in Genentech and I was thinking there must be something, there must be something. And, and I did some thinking because you can think when you're on sabbatical, you have time. And I thought, well, actually, one of the key things here is that every single pattern recognition receptor signaling pathway ends up in cell death one way or another. So caspase 11 kills cells. Caspase 1 kills cells. If you activate TLRs, eventually you'll end up with TNF. TNF will then drive a pathway of necroptosis. Okay, That's an active cell death. It's not 
that important for some and other, but the potential is there. And also we knew that caspase A is recruited to the inflammasome and caspase A is really important for triggering apoptosis. So there are several different ways in which the cell dies. So what if, what if cell death is actually one of the key or the key pathway that's critical for driving an adaptive immune response in concert with everything else? And indeed that is the answer. So I did some work with um, in Genentech and also with some guys in Australia. And you actually have to take out caspase 1, caspase 11, caspase 12, and RIPK3. RIPK3 is in the necroptosis pathway. If you take out all those cell death pathways, the mouse cannot clear salmonella. So a critical aspect for generating salmonella-specific CD4-positive T cells must lie in cell death in concert with cytokine production, in concert with antigen presentation. Um, so, and with this now has also been shown for TV, actually. Cell death is playing a really critical role here. And it's the redundancy is because of cell death, because you can get, you can kill your cells by different means. So there are many different ways for a cell to die. I don't know why there are so many ways for a cell to die, but it is kind of really interesting. And this is true in mice and also true in humans. So you can activate caspase 1, caspase 11, caspase 4, caspase 5. You can activate caspase 8. Caspase 8 can trigger pyroptosis under certain circumstances. Caspase 8 can inhibit RIP kinase, but TNF and TLR4 activity can activate RIP kinase, and this will lead to necroptosis. So in fact, in response to salmonella, you have necroptosis, apoptosis, and pyroptosis if you're a mouse. Also, probably if you're a human. But then we started to think about why is this, you know, is this the same in every animal? And in fact, although TLRs are really quite well conserved between different species, inflammasomes and caspases are not. So we started a piece of work to tr try and understand some of the species differences in um, inflammasomes and their effect or proteins. And it had been known for quite a while that animals in the carnivora genera, so we're talking about dogs, cats, and all the associated uh, carnivorous animals, they have a very weird caspase. So they don't have a traditional caspase 1, and they don't have a traditional caspase 11 or caspase 4. They actually have a fusion protein. It's really kind of cool. So they have the front end of caspase 1, and they have the back end of caspase 11. And that then potentially changes the way in which they respond in inflammasomes. So we predicted from this that because it had the active or the catalytic end of caspase 11, it would drive cell death and it probably wouldn't process IL-1 beta. So we started to have a think about this and, um, and I'd managed to persuade the guys at Genentech to do something quite cool for me. So I said, well, can we make a mouse that has the same caspase? And in fact, UK, it was, it was really cool. It was the first time this was ever done, actually. So you can, caspase 1 and caspase 11 in the mouse, are they, they're next to each other on the genome. So you can actually use CRISPR to chop out the catalytic domain of caspase 1 and the front end of caspase 11 and make a fusion protein that gives you the same caspase that you see in the dog. So we made the mouse and then we did the experiments. So this is wild type macrophages infected with salmonella and they get the expected profile of cell death. I christened the mouse the dogmo, dog mouse, obviously. So we then infected those macrophages and looked at cell death and they killed pretty efficiently, which kind of figures because they've still got the cell death business end in their caspase one. If you looked at the IL-1 beta in the mouse, you could see the wild type macrophages produce nice amounts of IL-1 beta and the dogmo didn't. So that was all going super well, super, super well. Likewise, because the role of caspase 11 is to recognize cytosolic LPS and drive cell death. But in the dogmo, you've chopped the cytosolic LPS recognition part off. So therefore, if you put LPS into the cytosol of the dogmo, the cell shouldn't die. Sure enough, wild type cells with cytosolic LPS die. Dogmo cells don't. Brilliant. Hypothesis looking great. Until you take dog cells and they don't behave quite the same way, which is kind of annoying. 
they really don't die efficiently at all, except at 24 hours in response to salmonella. And they only produce IL-1 beta at 24 hours. Okay, And I can absolutely tell you that these cells, if you look at them down the microscope, they are heaving with bacteria. They are absolutely loaded. So in fact, what happens at 24 hours is the cell is so full of bacteria, it just pops because it can't contain it anymore. So there's no program lytic cell death in dogs at all. They don't respond to cytosolic LPS at all either, which is as predicted. So this was really quite interesting and I don't fully understand it. I, it, it is very intriguing. So the first thing of course we did was check it in primary dog, nuclear, uh, dog mononuclear cells because the, we'd done all our work in the DH82 dog macrophage line and with an immortalized cell line, you can always have problems. But in fact, in response to salmonella or, or other inflammasome triggers, the primary cells really just did not die. It didn't matter what we put onto them, the primary cells were just not interested in death. And they produced some IL-1 meter, but they didn't die. So does that mean that inflammasome activation wasn't occurring at all? And the answer to that is no, it was actually. It's just very, very inefficient. So what you can see in the dog cells is really quite interesting. So we, um, we use a technique called propidium iodide uptake. So this is a fluorescent dye, which can go into the cell through pores if pores are formed, and then it fluoresces when it's inside the cells. So most of our cell death assays prior to this point was done with something called the LDH release assay. So cells rise and they, re they release LDH out of the cell, and that's an indication of lytic cell death. But if you couple that to propridium iodide uptake, that tells you where the pores are formed. So in fact, these are the traces here. And what you can see, this is salmonella down here, is that when you put on a high dose of salmonella, you do actually get some propridium iodide uptake. So there are some pores forming, but it's massively inefficient. So inflammasome activation in the dog is really inefficient. So it's kind of intriguing and in fact, Carnivores are carnivore, the carnivore are really weird. They have this ability to form an inflammasome, but the inflammasome is not very active. Their cells still die by apoptosis, but they don't have necroptosis either because they're missing the key effect or process, protein that drives necroptosis. So, in fact, the way in which dog cells die is predominantly by apoptosis or by just a complete steric mass in other words the bacteria fill up and the cell can't contain them anymore but they really are very handicapped in the concept of cell death it's really very very defective they're also missing a whole host of nlrs but that's another story so this was intriguing because i was writing this up around the time that uh, covid19 jumped into mink which are carnivore mutated and then jumped back out again so I was able to spin a potential story that this was important, which is where we all met because you saw the article written up in The Economist, right? So, um, so this, was, this was kind of intriguing. But at the same time, we've done a lot of work on chickens because chickens are key carriers of salmonella typhimurium. Salmonella typhimurium from chicken meat or from eggs causes food poisoning in people. And chickens are also massively defective in cell death pathways. So they don't have effective inflammasomes at all. Okay, they have an NLR, they have an adapter protein, they have caspase 1, but it doesn't do any of the things that it does in other species. There are no, there's no gastrin in D, so it, it can't drive pyroptosis. They can drive apoptosis because the apoptosis machinery is, seems to be universally conserved. They can drive necroptosis because they have that capacity too, and really surprisingly in chickens because salmonella does not cause necroptosis in humans or mice, but in chickens it does. So that actually is switching between pathways as to the different types of lytic cell death. And I used to think that chickens were different, but of course, because chickens are derived from dinosaurs, it's actually mammals that are different. So we're left with a kind of intriguing question is, is, is why did mammals generate a very large number of different cell death pathways, which don't seem to be important in, in birds at all? And I'll leave you with that philosophical question. So, because I'm, I'm finding this quite interesting at the moment. So in conclusion then, I talked all about TLR4. TLR4 signals uh, to LPS, as I've shown you, is a very efficient system. 
if you stimulate them with damp, so for example, if you stimulate TLF or amyloid beta, it's a very inefficient signaling pathway. And presumably this will have kinetic differences and we're exploring this at the moment. Pattern recognition receptors have non-redundant roles in controlling the salmonella load, but pattern recognition activity converges on cell death and so cell death must be central, I think, to driving specific uh, adaptive immunity. And then finally, the roles of inflammasomes and lytic cell death differs profoundly between species. And whether this is important in zoonotic transmission of pathogens or not, I don't know. But it's a, it's a question I find very intriguing, and it's why I'm here in Indiana for us to discuss these concepts. And it's been fun. This is the lab. I never used to show a COVID photo, but this is a COVID lab photo. Um, it was taken a few weeks ago. We've just been told today that we don't have to wear masks in work, so we'll probably move away from it. Um, this is the lab at the vet school. Um, and Panny, this is Panny here. You see he's gone gray working on all those mass models for all these years. Uh, and he's done a, a sterling, fantastic job. This is Joe who does a lot of the TLR4 signaling. Um, and uh, I haven't talked about the other guys work here, but they're, they're a great team and they're lots of fun. And we're lucky to be funded by, we've been funded by the Wellcome Trust on and off the MRC and the BBSRC. And I have quite a lot of industry funding. And I couldn't do any of the work without my collaborators. So the toll-like receptor mice came from Shijiro Kira in Japan. The nod-like receptor mice from my buddies in Boston, Doug, Kate, and Ika, who's now in Germany. And then Genetech helped me generate Dogmo, which was great. And then in Cambridge, all the um, imaging is done with Pietro Cucuta in physics and Dave Klenerman in chemistry. And that's it. I don't know if we can do questions online or in the room or exactly how the questions work, but I will try. Thank you very much. So I think if people have online have questions, um, you should be able to unmute. If you can't unmute, send a message in the chat and I will relay the question on. Gary. Yes, I have two questions. Great talk. Thank you. So, my first question is Does dog O manifest diarrheal salmonella? Don't know because we haven't infected it in vivo. Yeah, so, so Gary asked whether or not dogmo uh, manifests a diarrheal disease. And the answer is I don't know because we didn't do the experiments in vivo because we uh, generated a few mice, but not enough to do an in vivo experiment. And uh, second question is does the limitation in um, their, uh, cell, living cell death capacity uh, in chickens and in dogs or carnivores reduce the efficiency of adaptive immune response? That's an interesting question. I don't know. So the chickens we can't tell because as we've been discussing. So Gary asked whether or not the change in lytic cell death alters the efficiency of adaptive immunity generation in chickens and dogs. I would anticipate probably not because I think it's a total loss of cell death that's required. And one of the things that I didn't say is you can uh, get a switch in apoptosis to a lytic form of apoptosis. And that is through a protein called gastomini, and that is conserved in all species. So I can't rule out that apoptosis doesn't drive some lytic cell death indirectly in that way. Irrespective of that, the dogs don't really do it, but they do seem to generate adaptive immunity to other pathogens quite well. But we don't ever vaccinate dogs against salmonella um, because they're super good at generating diarrhea and getting rid of the bug. So it's not something that causes a lot of problem in dogs. Chickens we do vaccinate against. They don't get disease with typhimurium anyway. So it, it's kind of one of those things that's really quite difficult to um, understand, but chickens can generate adaptive immunity. But I think that it's the fact you've got a whole host of different pathways. It probably doesn't matter how the cell dies, but you need cell death in order to generate an adaptive immune response, which is kind of a roundabout way of answering your question, I think. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. 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 Hang on, let me check the chat. Hold on. This is it the same number of let me just open it anyway, then we can at least see. No, um, no questions in the chat. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, 
Uh, okay, I have a question this oh. is from Henry. Uh, yeah, it's very nice talk, and Thank this you. also very complicated system. Uh huh. Always. Right. So yeah. Yeah. So one question I do have is uh, for the uh, activation of uh, Kaba B uh, by Salmonella in the yep. microphage. Is is it's a rel A or the C rel subtype that's being activated in this case? Rel A. Mm -hmm. Okay, rel A. And and you do show that uh, there's they have, tend to have a dynamic moving to the nucleus and then moving out, right? Yep, that's uh, correct. And, yeah. So the, that pattern repeats for a few cycles, like they show in other situations. You ha have a damped oscillation of uh, Kaba B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So I had been I assumed that what would happen is it would behave the same as the the work by Mike White, for example, in fibroblasts, where they saw really nice oscillations. In fact, in macrophages in response to LPS, you get a very sharp first peak. After that, you get very minor oscillations. So you, you, the damping occurs really quickly after the first peak of translocation in and out of the nucleus. So it's different. Macrophages are different to the uh, fibroblast models that we used. Okay. So the uh, so the like the first peak, how, what the, how long it lasts? For example, it lasts for a about 10 minutes, if I remember correctly. Okay, uh, I, and the que my next question is, then the, the transcriptional effect, that happens further, uh, you know. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, further down the line. I, did, I didn't show, because because I was trying to cover a lot of ground, I didn't show that. Uh -huh. um, but it, yeah, it's published actually in uh, a paper in eLife in 2018 from mm. uh, the group. And you can see the, the really nice, uh, translocation of NF-kappa B into the nucleus, the NF-kappa B drops, so the peak drops, and then after that you see an increase in the RFP, which is the red fluorescent protein, which is linked to the TNF reporter. So you can see the nice the nice phase separation of the two peaks. It's um, yeah, it's quite cool. I, I missed out my nice cool movie where I showed you. I could show you that in real time. It's um, it's pretty neat. Okay, so so can we say that the the target transcription is kind of a time integrating the uh, the railway uh, signal, you know, says? I'm not quite sure I understand. Sorry, would you mind repeating that? Yeah, I'm kind of saying that your your the, the, the input with railway the of kappa B is kind of a short lived, right? Yes. But then is, the yes. output is happening at a much later time. Yeah. So I'm just saying that if that's uh you know as a from modular perspective. If that's kind of integrating the uh, yeah. the response of of a cover B yeah, over yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. You're right. That's exactly what's happening. Cool. Mm -hmm. do, do you mind put the your reference uh, uh, on the chat? Okay, here we go. Oh. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no problem. Is, yeah, fast. Thank you, Jim. No problem. Mm -hmm. So Gary's asked, what is it about lytic cell death that facilitates adaptive immunity? I have no idea. I mean, I could speculate. It could be damps. It could be more antigen release. Um, I really don't know, but it's it's really very intriguing. Because the, uh, the genetic cells and macrophages that have already been infected yeah. are yeah, they are. The, the the cells are indeed presenting the antigen. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just find I find it really intriguing. I don't understand it at all. Um, but it's uh it's a really clear effect. It's the only the only mouse strain that has shown any deficit in clearing and generating effect or T cells is the multiple program cell death knockout. I wonder if there's a way to see whether or not have a proportional increase in the number of antigen-presenting cells that carry that particular antigen. It might just be like a, ample, a necessary amplification mm -hmm. step, right? That can get enough engagement of the sequence. Potentially, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the had the video of the back crisis being affected and only a couple actually got well they seem to respond radically different only a couple. Do you think that's a vitro effect? Do you think that occurs in vivo? Is it just a subset of activities? My best guess is I think it probably does it. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, so Jim's asking whether or not uh, is the heterogeneity in macrophage infection an in vitro effect, or would it happen in vivo? So, in other words, do all the macrophages get infected in vivo? I suspect it happens in vivo. So, um, if you look at a salmonella infection in vivo, and we've done quite a lot of this, and you section tissues and you have a look, you can see in lesions. So, the salmonella forms a lesion, which is eventually walled off in a granuloma. You can see macrophages in those lesions and not all those macrophages are infected. Yet there can be a very high density of bacteria in and around the uh, lesion. So I'm guessing that that is the case. Um, in, in vivo, it's much more complicated, obviously. Um, we, we have done things like playing around with changing the activation state of macrophage M1 and M2, uh, and that can tweak it a little bit, but it in the situation that we're looking at in, in vitro, I don't think that's the case. I, I'm really very intrigued as to the heterogeneity for macrophage infection. Um, so I, I'm, my guess is it does occur in vivo, but it's kind of quite hard to prove. There is the, the components where the dinosaurs always the same as all of But they have slightly different kind of repertoire. Uh, the single cell seq RNA studies would indicate that macrophages have all fully inflammasome competent. Yeah. Um, I have a question on the dimerization process. Yep. Uh, so the, the, does dimerization require both monomer uh, ligandates or it can be just one has a ligand and the other one uh, not no, no ligands on it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Do you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I I kind of assume that you need MD, the MD2 TLR4 binding site to be occupied by both by two molecules of LPS, but I really can't prove that at all. It's, it's I every time I look at that slide, I wonder whether you <laughs> need two molecules or one molecule of LPS. I really don't know. Great question. <laughs> 